I'm grateful for the organizers to invite me to this meeting, which is not my first time. And well, anyway, good to come here, I would say, every five years for so many years. <laughs> and unfortunately, I drank iced water, so my throat is in trouble, but well, I try to carry on. This talk was supposed to be given by Daniela Lorenzo, but somehow she decided to get pregnant. <laughs> I did a baby. I told her not to do that. She didn't listen. <laughs> so, well, uh, first I just say what's happening in Georgia at this time. And then uh, we always make improvements to software. And then one of the issues we had was convergence problems. What would say in the situations where there was weak imbalance with phenotypes. So, let's say for one trade, we got say, a million phenotypes for another one, 1,000. So anyway, in this case, kind of those phenotypes of, of 1,000 need to kind of filter into GDBs everywhere. So I'm kind of working on it to make it faster. Then we have a categorical, uh, say, what we got, uh, a CBLAP 90 rd program that can cover one categorical trait and multiple uh, linear traits with very large data set. And then uh, there is lots of interest with multiple categorical traits, especially health traits. So we're looking into a new method where we can have a large data program with multiple, multiple categorical traits that is based on the EM approach that was, <clears throat> I think, presented at this meeting uh, 20 years ago by DeQuas. And then P values in GWAS with national data sets. For applications, now we are kind of trying to apply single step in there with a contract. And then uh, Andres Legara was hired by CBCB, he's working part on it. For uh, everyone is interested in disease resistance, so we have a project on canalization for disease resistance, how to somehow find which animals are more disease resistance without having extra data. And then I have topics that kind of I'm excited. Uh, uh, just by myself, and then I'm not sure whether I should be excited, I should be retiring anytime soon, but sometimes when it's excited by something. So this is potential negative effects of genomic selection, it's kind of a new topic. And then with that kind of prime estimation with the live data, so what's going on, we can apply around to kind of baby data sets, even 20,000 genotypes, if we have half a million uh, general actually can do it and have big changes in parameters happening. So, question for what to do. <coughs> well, improvement of accuracy with sequence data, this is kind of the old topic, and explaining peculiarities of GWAS. These are kind of the topics that I'll present today. Well, uh, well, we'll see what happens. So, first, why do we do GWAS in Georgia? So, we have been active in genetic evaluation across species and we have lots of customers and the goal is to just to have the evaluation as good as it goes. Well, in, in have uh, most of recent papers do GWAS. So you have GWAS as a tool, well, you have lots of collaborations and lots of citations. So anyway, it is good to have it. And then we started the project over 10 years ago I and mean, there was a paper and the paper now has over there were a few hundred citations, which means it was good and good move in in the field, well, let's say with that kind of metrics. So well, uh, how does it work? We simply calculate GBVs, we calculate the sleep effects, and then we calculate percentage of variance explained by uh, origin, and that's that's how we done. And that project generated lots of surprising results. For example, which is low data, you have, you have one method, say for GWAS, and there is kind of a big uh, uh, region on the right side, 2.5% explained variance. When you do classical GWAS, how much is it? Is it 2%? 38 Well, is it good enough? Well, try base B is 23. <laughs> At 10% of data, the 23% becomes 0.5 zero and something that has come. So it's a very good way to generate new papers every month. <laughs> anyway, well, and then we did some work with sequence data, and the first one was done a few years ago by Breno Fragomeni, and he used 
records of stature, and then what it is, and then the yeah, other so, so, statue of the four million records, and he used uh, genotypes of 27,000 sites. And what he had, the uh, genotype data was the regular SP panel plus specially selected potential causative variants. And the results are kind of interesting. So, anyway, uh, these are the reliabilities. So, first, you look at the regular GLAP. And on the left side is without sequence data, on the right very sequence data. And then well, you see some improvements. So it looks like the effort paid off. And then but we found that since we use science over them, and then they have different accuracies, uh, we did not adjust for that. So we use heterogeneous residuals. And now accuracies went up. And then we try to apply special weighting, a regular one to make bigger, bigger, smaller, bigger, smaller, smaller. And it didn't work, but the accuracy, the reliabilities were high. So we tried to use GBLAP unweighted, and then accuracy shoot up, more no weighting. And then GBLAP, I don't know why the numbers don't show up here on the right, using special algorithm by Paul Van Raven, it's nonlinear method, and the accuracy shoot up. So this is GBLAP just information based on the regressive proofs of both. And now a regular single step was putting everything together and we see is the highest and no difference. So anyway, that was kind of our work from a few years ago. And uh, now there is more work. <clears throat> so one of those is that in single step now we can we have key values. Is it good to have key values? Some, some papers require that, so we have it. And formulas are actually pretty simple. So key values are functions of the F, absolute value of F and PFF and, and of standard deviation for the sleep effect. So we have standard deviation for green values. We can convert it to standard deviation for SMPs. And it works pretty well. And let's say and also we apply it to for large data sets. And what's the reason for applying with, uh, with the data set? So let's say you have sequence data. And while well, I don't know how many uh, SMPs, let's say that 10 million SMPs, but those SMPs, let's say, are kind of collected without an error. Then you apply the Z program. What's your dimension? 20,000. Well, oh, in Kitsu, it will be less than. So simply because of LD, you have clusters over that. So basically, individual SMPs are not discernible. discernible. And well, let's me. So anyway, we have that, uh, let's say, modification where we can use really large data sets. So how does it work? So we try that with American Angus, about 5 million phenotypes. And first, we try to keep 1,000 genotype animals. And then, What's going on? The surprising thing is that only four regions are significant. How does it come? I mean, we have that 1,000 genes over there, but only four show up. Why is four? Well, for some reason, the rest is not showing up, but also the amount of mistakes here is very small because we have kind of correct model, multiple trait. We use all the data. So anyway, that's what it looks like. What happens if we have 500 genotype animals in the analysis? Can we do that? Well, we can do it. And we gain two extra points. So anyway, so what we see here is that with the large data, how clean those plots are. And the second is how few things we have detected. Is it real or is it not? And then there was a recent paper in GSC on somehow a month, let's say, was that G was over many lines, and I think that was in beef, and they had more or less the same result, very few points. So anyway, well, uh, the, uh, we, we still had one extra project where you should sequence, and that is using data from the Rosling Institute. So what's the story over that? I mean, at one time, John Hickey initiated a project uh, uh, with partial funding from uh, the government that's part of funding from companies to somehow uh, acquire genotypes from large companies and then impute them to sequence. And he was extremely skilled in attracting people. He 
you have over 20 students of those posts of just one person. And then in, in the end, we ended up with three analyzing this data. So I'd like to share some of the results. So well, in that project, there were six lines, and then M are maternal lines, and T are terminal, perhaps maternal lines. And you see the biggest one is about 100,000 genotype animals. Well, the sequence of small numbers close to a thousand each, and then imputed to a sequence. And then what happened afterwards? Well, there were lots of traits over there. And then let's look at just terminal line one, two, three, and the three has almost one million phenotypes, and then the, the, first, the first two are just one third of the cell. So, well, let's see how did it work. So, what did they do? They, they found about 20,000 variants and about 10 million segregated across lines. So, well, what they did, they just uh, partitioned the genome into windows, and from each window, I think there were 40,000 windows, they selected uh, a SNP with the highest value. And that, that method was called top 40K, if I understand that well. And then, so why 40K? Because the regular chip was 40K as well. And then they also tried to find only the significant SNPs. So they have the regular chip, 40K, and add over that significant SNPs and kind of finding kind of pseudo causal variants. And well, what they did, they look at the accuracies of GDB and say, and single line and multiple line. And I explained what's going on, and then also we compared our results with that from Rosten. So this is the prediction accuracy for two traits: first average daily gain, and the other is back fat, and they just one line. And as you see, we have cheap, we have accuracy of 0.5, and then we have 40, we increase accuracy by 0.1 by one point, and well. So anyway, the improvement is very, very small here. And then it does some other traits, and this is the other line, and the results are the same. And in a small line, actually, by using focus and this, we are reducing the accuracy. Why in that? Perhaps I try to discuss later this time. And the next one is they try to do multi-line analysis. And why is that? So sure that we have many lines and talk all of them are kind of sharing similar causative uh, variants. So if you have many lines, we have bigger data, we can estimate those causative variants better, and then we can have a better prediction. So let's first look from that if we do that evaluation only for the biggest line, then we see whether we are using single or multi lines all together in that of matter. However, if we use it say the complete data analysis just for a simple smaller line we actually losing accuracies. So why is that? Well in genomic selection really we are not estimating it because of LD to QTLs. We are simply estimated by uh, say by the values of independent chromosome segments and we are different a lot. So anyway then this was the results over there, the predictions are not QTL oriented, that's what it kind of shows. And then uh, the next thing is that actually also use another uh, analysis with, with base R. And I don't know whether uh, all of you know what base R is. It assumes that uh, SNPs are in one of the various categories, various relative variants, 1, 10, 100, 1000, it completely ignores LR for well, link with this equilibrium. So anyway, here we have base R, and then with two, so we'll say first with the cheek. This is the cheek here. Well, well, it doesn't show here. But, sorry. Sorry, I messed it up. So I think this is showing. So anyway, the cheek alone 55 accuracy, and then with sequence data, we actually increasing our accuracy here. And now let's say what's going on with single step. 
Now, now we are using complete phenotypic data, and with base R, we get using phenotypic data for genotype pain loss, and as we see, not much is changing. So anyway, it's kind of interesting what's going on, and it would be good to go a little bit deeper and kind of gain some understanding why such things are happening. So what we have found is that we have little or no any sequence data, even so it contains information for sure. Then we also know that in GWAS we can do two types of GWAS test as percentage of various explained by one megabase or by p values. So which one is actually better and why is it one megabase? So if it's one megabase, you want to find the causative C, we have a chance of one million. Why people don't use 100K? Why not if they use 10K? Perhaps if they don't, they have a good reason to do that. And then we see few regions explain more than 1% of additive bias. So does it mean there are no major genes or very few genes or whatever? It's not clear. Well, since we have a very effective selection over many years, it means that there are genes over that and selection is effective, but somehow not many, not many major genes. And also there is peculiarity in publishing. So we have small study, we detect lots of things. We have big studies, we don't detect much. It's kind of contrary to your expectations. So perhaps I point you to a paper. First conception rate on 2,000 calls and heifers. It's a NIFA supported product. So, uh, what is it? Is it good to improve conception rate in wholesale cutters? For sure it is. But there are some kind of, uh, let's say, fantastic results. Usually, this, this trait has a fertility of 1%, and they estimate it at 36%. Isn't this one important? <laughs> well, magic, magic. <laughs> and then they identified 146 unique loss. I think I had it kind of misspelled in the paper, they up that number to 300. So anyway, well, and then if you look at those kind of points, the points are kind of random. There is no any shared whatsoever. So anyway, this is small data set. And this is a big data set, GWAS on almost 300,000 post-train cars. And we see a couple of points, all with LD trail and so forth. So what's going on here? And uh, my, uh, uh, my former student, uh, uh, Ivan Potson, who is now a faculty in Edinburgh, say he started a simulation project. What he did, he simulated a population with 100 identical QPLs, it would explain 1% of the genetic variance, and each would be equally spaced. And then say we wanted to catch a Manhattan block. That was our expectation, 100 points. What he got is kind of a random stuff. And this seems Manhattan plot based on SP values. So he thought, well, let's move to p values. He moved to p values, not much. So, what to do? And the project, well, he said, since he got 100 identical equidistant QPS, he could average them out. The noise would average out, and something would show up. And that indeed has happened. So well, we have kind of a curve. Well, why why is that curve like this? Does it follow anything like that? Well, and then you start building uh, books and then on LD and try and then we try to apply pairways link with specifically green curve. And in fact, it fits fairly well. And then say R well close to point nine, so it's a kind of pretty good match. And then you can kind of link the width of the curve to effective population size. And then also find out, say, uh, if you want to account for 80% of acute and variance, how wide is this? And then it, it depends on, of course, on effective population size. In, for cattle, it will be about two megabases. So one way mega base is what people use is pretty good. In chickens and pigs, it would be about five mega bases. So you have one trick here, and it's a fact it extends very, very far away. So anyway, that was uh, Ivan's contribution.
And what about humans fitting care? So finding QTLs in humans is very simple. In animals, it's not that simple. So that's part of the story. And just, uh, so what is Manhattan plot composed of? But we have signals from QTLs that would look like that. Would be pretty wide signals. And if they are close to QTLs, well, they would kind of overlap. Then we have signals to the relationships. And then they are very strong. They also have their peaks. They could be mistaken for QTL, but they are just relationships. And they contain most of the information in the genetic evaluation. And finally, there is noise. And then in the end, we have the combined Manhattan plot. How does it change with data? Well, if you have larger QTN, then somehow that part due to QTNs will be bigger. And then if we have more data, then the noise will be much smaller. So, well, so why single step accounts for QTN? And then simply if we have that kind of response to one QTN, we find that a couple of sleeps actually can cover the curve and can account for it. So we have really large data sets. We don't really need to find QTNs. We can simply, yeah, let's uh, GBLAB uh, do it. And then just as an illustration, that say the small affected population size is hard to detect something. There, there is a simulation study of Sanborn done in our group. And then what he was showing here is that through his affected population size 20, almost nothing is visible and signals are very wide. If you have affected population 200, things are a whole lot better. What are the affected population sizes? Well, those that we try to estimate about 50 in chicken and pigs, about 150 in horses, about 100 in animals. I don't know what they are. Currently. And then why have we identified so few QTLs? So it's kind of my hypothesis is that we could have unselected population. It shows a distribution of genes from largest to smallest. So we have a few genes with very large effect here and lots of those with a very small one. But then we do selection year round, after round, after round, and then all the good genes kind of become fixed. So then the number of those who are left is not too big. And why they are left? Because they have play of trauma. Otherwise, they would kind of be fixed. And then we kind of have a detection threshold. So in fact, the number of QTLs or QTLs that we can detect is perhaps limited only to the biggest one. And while well, is this true or not? Well, I show you the old star and the new star. So this is two aspects in 75,000 pops and bones by Shogun Shumata. So milk fat parity, and what shows over that digger. And now mortality fat parity, what shows here digger. Do you see these graphs very much? You don't see that. Why? Because you want to create the fat graph for milk. I mean, you can do it in a few days, get the data, do it. For mortality, I mean, it's one year editing. And that's why it's lots of work. Well, is it, is it something new? I, uh, and there were some reports about the pleurotropy, but perhaps the best evidence of that was given by Peter Weimar this year at the EAP meeting. So what he did, did he do? He showed Manhattan plots for day, well, for a number of trades in peaks. And you see that all kinds of peaks for every trade here. But also what he kind of he found is those peaks were different for each light. And we would expect that would be kind of similar because the same genes are distributing in same, uh, say, a bridge, well, I say in same species, but somehow it was different. What was interesting was what happened if we tried to get GWAS for an index, nothing. Play a trouble. So kind of the big effects cancel out. Uh, so in the end, I mean, if you want to find kind of big genes in individual traits, it's okay. If you want to find in an index, well, it's not as good. So anyway, I think it was an interesting study. So anyway, that's my 
uh, first part of, of the talk. Do I have a few minutes? I think I'll assign myself a few minutes. So, well, conclusion, PPM profile is wide for small affected population size. And if we have lack signals in Chihuahua, most likely due to many reasons. And then if there is no LD curve, perhaps it's a false detection. And it's especially they happen with implication. <coughs> then large PPL show theotropy, and, and then PPL is not visible in the index. And finally, single step accounts for PPL with large data. So, well, now I move to the next topic possibly negative effects of genome selection. So this is kind of my new topic that I'm excited by. And then for beef, perhaps it only has limited relevance at this time. We'll see what happens in five or 10 years. So I just want to present the story. So until about two years ago, I mean, uh, all industry reports in Georgia indicated success with genomic selection. And we have lots of uh, industrial collaborators. Yeah. And about two years ago, I will mean, say those people came and they said, we have this problem, it increases, this problem is increases. So, of course, I cannot tell details because they are all uh, secret, or oh, let's say confidential. But anyway, that's what's going on. But what somehow I can report over that is in peaks, for example, there is still deteriorating south survival and increased mortality. In GIF, I've been told, told that, there, that there is the authority feet and legs that you know it more than I, I, I do, anyway. And in dairy, the new problem is short tips and increased heart mortality. And well, of course, increased sensitivity to heat stress. And then all across species, there is the, the deterioration of disease remittance. So what's going on? Is it, is it real or is it a fact of genomic selection or is it something else? So anyway, well, I, I look at that topic kind of from, from uh, let's say, from a general viewpoint, and then what is genetic selection? It's an optimization. You gain something, you lose something. So you gain on trade that you select, and you lose on trade that you do not select and that are, that are antagonistic. Well, do you lose in the end? Not necessarily. If you lose on trades that are no longer important or you provide kind of management, then in the end, the effect is good. So, well, what is the history of selection strategies over, over time? Well, of course, we know there was a dom domestication event over many, many years or centuries or thousands of years. Then there was kind of an informal selection without knowing theory done, done by individual people. Then with the advantage of quantitative genetics, we had large scale single trade selection for production trades. Then in around 1990s, reality changed that to multi-trade selection with fitness trades. And finally we have genomic. So let me show perhaps what's going on with uh, adaptation. And I don't know how many of you know the book, Jan, Dance, Jerks, and Steel by Jared Diamond. I think that should be a required reading for an animal science major because while well, it has lots of interesting information how things develop on Earth. And one of those, they say, well, uh, how out of perhaps one million animal species, only perhaps 10 have been selected as farm animals. Well, this is, I'm telling this story, not that it's excited. Well, second, why animals show heat and humans don't show heat? Well, anyway, it's kind of adaptation mechanism. But it's, it's a very good uh, book. And then the second one, the genetics of adaptation, domestication, and the paper looks at kind of changes uh, with adaptation. So with the process, there are winners and losers, and then I'm just uh, uh, listing a couple of them. So what are the winners? Growth. We, we want growth. Milk is a dairy cow, so we want more milk. A mating procedure. They don't need to last for a long time. They don't need to involve fights of males. They are simple. And then what are the losers? Food finding. What farmers provide? Seasonal production. Perhaps not no longer needed. Predator avoidance. Well, farmer helps, 
and straight the brain size has reduced because it uses energy, so if you want efficiency, we don't need big brains. <laughs> So well, uh, well, uh, so what the what was kind of the, uh, the the other effect of selection? Um, all say with with that middle level kind of single trait selection, and we know that uh, growing a chicken is the best example, perhaps, of a very selective, very well, let's say, successful breeding strategy. So when I look at the paper by Ethan Sor. And then they say animals say birds showed unlimited appetite and obesity. And then, well, that was not good. So what would, would that be a selection again? That no, it would be too slow because this is low credibility trait. So the industry uh, instituted a management modification by artificial lighting. Means light animals eat, no light animals don't eat. Then full survival of mates, they don't last three months, they last one month. Well, if the old cohort is not working, we have the new one. Increased susceptibility to diseases. Well, it's kind of nothing new. <laughs> so in that time, there was antibiotics. Now, I uh, well, better think it's not possible. And low catchability. And then the industry has incubators with very high uh, temperature control. At the beginning, they need to be uh, heated and then cooled at the end, and so forth. What was really strange is that all companies showed more or less similar prompts at the same time, even so they were selecting their own animals with kind of a similar, uh, say, goal. And then I guess at the beginning, nobody was talking to anyone else. They said they all, all, they all had problems, say, in their own companies, but in the end, it was just that industry-wide problem, so problems by emission cap confidential. Well, is it, uh, is all Adam's undesirable effects of selection well known or not known? So I, I did that, that a paper from 25 years ago, 1998, undesirable side effects of selection for high production efficiency in farm animals. And this is, what does it say, how the references on desirable effects in broilers, pigs, and dairy cattle. Unfortunately, no beef cattle. I'd say it would be less since beef is not as strongly selected. And they say future application of DNA techniques and will lead to more dramatic consequences. Why? Wow. Unless we put things into a selection increase. So, well, that's actually what the industry did. And I'd like to show what's, what's going on with the, the genomic selection. So let's say this is the old uh, single trait selection. We have production, say we have select, uh, selection for production. Production is going up with hash. Raw fitness. Well, raw fitness is antagonistic trait, well, it's to go down. But we have our management guys working, they come with new methods. So things are improving, but realize fitness is still declines. And for some time it can be tolerated, but there is a point where it can no longer be tolerated. So we have multiple trade selection. So what was going on is in raw fitness, now it doesn't decline as much. Management is the same, cannot be improved. And realized fitness now can be somehow constant. It's no longer deteriorating. And what happens with genomic selection? Everything goes up. So I mean, production, trends for production go up. For low credibility trades, accuracy do not go up that much, but antagonistic response or correlated response is still strong, so we have bigger declines, management the same. So we have an extra, let's say, decline in fitness. So what we can kind of summarize is that before, say, negative effect of selection, were balanced by management changes, but now the changes are too fast for them to have. Well, is it kind of made up or is there any substance to it? And then I picked up a graph from official CDC side. And what does it show? So first, what is it? Phenotypic trend. You see a decline around 
and uh, up to yeah, about 2000, and then we see improvement. This is one of the genetic. We see we don't have any degeneration, but the improvement is really small. And what about management? Well, management goes up. Why? Because now it's time to improve. Well, is this graph kind of uh, realistic or not? But that's the official one. And Anders Legara tells me that things are key a little bit better than here. Yeah. And then on top of that, we have changes in health abilities and then in genetic correlations. They would be strong in chicken and then in pigs, somewhat in dairy, not as big as in beef. And these are the changes in fertility from, from growth uh, done by Jorge Hidalgo and look at the red line. And then he found that fertility dropped by one half. So, well, if we are trying to make any selection progress, our gene uh, standard deviation is just 70% of the original one. And then also the genetic correlation with reproduction changed from minus 0.3 to minus 0.5. Well, if traits are really antagonistic, we can't make too much progress. So uh, uh, there are many reasons why this is happening, and this is kind of a very good area for research. So what are the reasons? Bulmer effect, which is the natural one, but changing the resource allocation, because this is a bigger one. Changes in gene frequencies, trade definitions, trade that were before are not the same ones. G by E and uh, recessive, you name it. But I see a number of PhD dissertations here. Okay. And what to do about it? Well, first, I mean, if we see any problematic trade, we need to start on standard recording. And then we need to update the selection index. Because the selection index, but using unrealistic variances and uh, and covariances, it doesn't help as much. And then also we need to focus on traits that need help. So I'm just showing you which traits may need help. So let's say look at heritability over time. Well, if it's constant, well, let it be. But if it's declining, it means something is going on. And then genetic correlations, if they if they are dead. And the negative, let's say constant, it's okay. If they are declining, well, it's not good. So then we come to another question, how to estimate those parameters. And then, well, the simplest one would be to do use deep sampler or remote, but then by the definition, estimate viruses for the base population. And if we don't need base population, we need the last generation. Can we do that? Well, anyway, I would say that this is a topic but again, a couple of PhD dissertations. I tried my work a little bit, and then I mean how to do it, and then how to do it with natural data sets for any number of traits. And, well, and then, so how does it work? So perhaps some of you know the formula for accuracy by productivity by Ernest Lagarde. So what is it? This is, uh, yeah. So what, what is it? This is, Accuracy is predictivity. Predictivity is correlation of adjusted phenotypes for one animal based on bringing values obtained without that phenotype. And this is all divided by square root of predictivity. You can also find the theoretical accuracy uh, by that wire, and that's based on the number of reference population, predictivity, and also, number of independent chromosome segments or effective population size. If we merge them both, we come with this formula. And well, C is productivity. Is it a good formula? I tried to apply it to a couple of uh, data sets, and I just showed for one. So, this is what we have near to I have 580,000 genotypes, that's about 10 million phenotypes, not more, in a validation about 400,000 animals, assume chromosome segments 15,000, predictivity 55, initial heritability 35, calculated heritability 0.33. Well, somehow it works. It will be good to find decimal digits, I would not say, but it may be better than, uh, or perhaps there is, there is no alternative at this point. Can we do 
genetic correlation somehow. And then let's say this is the productivity, and this is productivity from trade I to trade I. What happens if we try productivity from trade I to trade J? Will something show up? And then, in fact, something show up. What shows up is a formula for, uh, say, genetic correlation. So we can have a formula for, for the genetic correlation based on productivity. And we have a number of people in our lab, uh, including my case, who is here, who are working on testing this method. But this is just uh, the initial uh, stage of the project. Well, time for conclusions. So response to QTL is wide, and for kicks and chicken, several megabases. And perhaps if we don't see any trail in Manhattan block, perhaps it's false QTLs. And then single step accounts for QTLs with large data. Then if, if we have really good QTLs, they are perhaps already fixed in traits under selection. Not necessarily new fish or new animals that have not been selected that are still distributing, but for traits for under long selection, perhaps all those good features are fixed. And then if we find something most likely, there's player problems, so we need to be really careful. And then there is potential negative effects of genomic selection on fitness traits. Why? Because we have faster correlated responses and potentially antagonism is increased. Is it more? Well, and then we need new methods to estimate genetic parameters. And I said that Mark Talman was working on something new at the Clay Center, so this project is very much welcome. Well, I think I'd like to uh, credit people in the lab and outside of the lab, and without whom the work would not be possible. And especially Daniela Lorenko, who is kind of leading the uh, the group, while I'm kind of uh, devoting more time to current our staff, and then lots of sponsors to provide data and then discussions so that in the end, if we have hypotheses, we can tell them quickly and we can come with some good answers that are really good for them. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Questions for Ignacio? I'm curious about your hypothesis that large effect QTL will be fixed. By definition, if there's no variation, how can it have any additive genetic variance? That's a good question. So, what's going on? So, the old hypothesis is repeated. Repeat the question. Okay, the, the question is saying that the big effects are probably fixed, so why do we have the genetic variation? And I think this is a very good question so when we have the, say, the assumption from the QTL era that a trait would be somehow explained by perhaps so many QTLs, not that many, 10, 20, perhaps 50. So perhaps that assumption is wrong. So I mean, in fact, we have thousands of genes who are contributing and then each gene is contributing to many different traits, and most of them are somehow below the detection level. So that's my, my assumption. Yeah. So, Ignacio, on, on, uh, your, your slides on uh, essentially uh, are the problems with uh, the problems with genomic selection that's provided just with now about the really topical thing. I'm trying to rationalize in my mind though that that question that Bob asked. So if, if we're dealing with traits that are controlled by hundreds or thousands of small effects QTL, then then how do we simultaneously so quickly see a reduction in additive variation? Because obviously we're not fixing a whole lot of small features that quickly. So how, how do you reconcile those two things? Does that make sense? Yeah, so Matt uh, asked the question, why do we are having so big changes, say, in fertility and then in genetic correlations, while changing gene frequencies are not that fast? 
And that's another question for a few PhDs. And I think what's going on first, and we have a Bulmer effect. And the Bulmer effect can, is pretty fast with selection, and then we have reduced selection intervals in peaks. I think it's about a year or something like that. For genetic correlations and for fitness traits, I think the traits are kind of redefined. So let's say that you, that the animal uses excess, well, let's say most of the energy for production and there is less energy for reproduction. So then the trait of reproduction contains less of innate reproduction and contains more of production with a negative sign. But this is a very good topic and, and I think we need discussions on the, on the area. I mean, uh, it was, so I mean, the uh, resource allocation is kind of a topic that is, uh, uh, let's say, studied by a few groups, but not too many.